I have to admit, and I really should be honest, there is one video in this series I've decided to divide into three that I'm really not sure I can do in one video, and that's this one. 1939 to 1965. It's interesting, to say the least. And there is a reason for this. There is, of course, World War II. There is, of course, all the other things which take place in this period. There is the death of, uh, death of Stalin, there's the construction of Stalin's fleets, there is the leadership that comes after that, then there is the rise of Khrushchev, the fall of Khrushchev, there is Kuznetsov and Gorshkov and the, the passing of the flag between them from one who was obsessed with a small ship navy and really wanted to concentrate on submarines. It's kind of like Donitz to Raider in reverse. <laughs> um, how do I explain it? Kuznetsov, very much the submarine guy going, I want submarines, I want submarines, in the face of Stalin's obsession with building larger ships and laying the grounds for what would become the sort of massive Soviet submarine fleet later on. And then there's Gorshkov who comes in and goes, Yeah! But you need us to do naval diplomacy, don't you? You need us to actually have a forward presence, don't you? You need us to actually do something around the world, don't you? Yes. So we need surface ships, don't we? Uh, yes. Yes, Admiral Gorshkov, now please stop pointing a sword at me. It, it doesn't need to be said. And no, apparently no one can fire you. We've tried several times, and it turns out even the KGB and the GRU are both scared of you. Please, put the sword down. Gorshkov was very successful at ruling his, minis his ministry. Um, other people came and went. Gorshkov remained, and they did what Gorshkov told them to, or they went quicker than they wished to. If they did well, they could find themselves promoted, if they did what he told them to. If they did badly, they could find themselves demoted to Siberia. It's very cold. Very, very cold. But, there is a problem, because if I do too many videos on this period, and try and divide on too many videos, A, I won't give you the overview I want to give you, as a sort of introduction. And B, in the end, it can be an infinite number of videos. It's, for example, picking which submarines to talk about. I can talk about the whiskies because I think, technologically, they have a massive impact on the Soviet Navy and how it develops. But... Should I talk about the Zulus? The Foxtrots? Should I talk about the S-Class? There are all these different submarines that come in. And then we've got the whole different campaigns they take part in World War II. The idea that the Soviet Navy is doing nothing in World War II is a very fetching idea to some, but it's not true. They don't fight necessarily the big massive battles that we associate with the Mediterranean theatre, and certainly not the battles on the scale of the Pacific, which means that people sort of, to an extent, can overlook them. But there again, look at the amount of water space they have to fight in. The Black Sea is a lot smaller than the Mediterranean, and the Baltic is a lot smaller than the Black Sea. And the actual section of the Baltic they can operate in is very, very limited. And then you go, well, what about the stuff they have in the North Atlantic, in the Arctic? Why do they not get more involved out there? Well, again, there is, the trouble is they could, and they probably should, but as we went over last time when we were talking about this subject, the Northern Fleet is not exactly a well-established formation. And when I say not exactly a well-established formation, it was formed in 1933, and its infrastructure uh, develops slowly. I'm fairly sure it was part of some five-year plan at some point, but it just didn't happen. Now, the Winter War, 
with Finland, 1939-1940, is pretty much a mess, okay? The Soviet Navy does its best. It's one of the largest fleets in the, in the Baltic. It's very capable. It's got a couple of battleships. It's got this, that, and the other, all, all these cruisers. It's a very strong formation. But the trouble is, as any Russian who has fought a Finn will tell you, if they're being honest, so probably about hmm, a few drinks in. Sorry, YouTube. Finns are very good on the defensive. Incredibly good on defensive. They're so good on the defensive, they tend to take ground while they're defending. No one's quite sure how they do it, but there are some nations which do have certain attributes which turn up in their ability to fight. You know, we talk about the British, usually people start to mention their stoicism of British forces under fire. No one's quite sure where it comes from, it just seems to be almost a self-expectation of it. French forces tend to have a LAN, and you know, that's what we're sort of looking for. American forces tend to be, well, very American. It's good. It's a good thing. But the thing is, everyone has some national characteristic which you see in their armed forces. With the Finns, it's a case of you're fighting them. You are sure they're there. And then you look around and it turns out they're all behind you and all over the place. And you have no idea where they are. All you know is that you're very, very afraid. Basically, fighting the Finns is kind of like fighting a horror movie. And you're not the smart person who's going to find out and solve the problem. You're one of the people who gets killed. So that's war with Finland. The Navy does quite well. They have to deal with a few issues. But the Finnish aren't that large a Navy. And mostly the two navies don't get into much contact. Not for the Finns' lack of trying, but mainly because the Soviets... The main purpose of the Navy is supposed to be to assist the army by bombarding positions which the army is trying to take. The Navy gets fed up with firing at the same positions over and 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 over again. It happens. Apparently 12 times in a row. But we'll leave that to one side. Kind of like a woodpecker with a blunt beak. <clears throat> so, the war with Finland, not that successful. But, remember, at, broadly speaking, the same time as they're fighting war with Finland, they also invade the Baltic states. Yes. That little part about the Molotov written, uh, Ribbentrop Pact that's often forgotten, because, of course, they divide up Poland. But it's not just Poland. And this is one of the reasons why, honestly, probably the Allies should have declared war on the Soviet Union as well. But they waited, and it happened late enough, they were already involved in the war against Germany, and frankly, <clears throat> that was the nearer, bigger threat. It was never... You can argue whether it was or wasn't about defending Poland, whether it was about trying to stop Germany expanding and becoming an even bigger threat. We'll leave that to one side. There are so many issues going on there. But yes, most nations don't recognise the Baltic states which are taken over by the Soviets, but they are taken over by the Soviets. It was not a good experience for the Baltic states. It was not a nice scenario to be occupied by organizations which were competing to show their loyalty to Stalin. It's not a good scenario. And they showed their loyalty by being able to round up more and more enemies of the people. And turns out enemies of the people are people you don't like can be women who say no, women who resist, women who you 
are basically just trying to kidnap. And by the way, those women can be very, very young girls, if that's your inclination. They can be any bloke who happens to be with those women. They can be anyone who appears to see what you're doing. There are all sorts of abuses of power which take place. It is absolutely horrendous. And I'm making this point, and I'm saying it this way, because I do realise sometimes in my videos, when I focus on the naval aspects of something, people think I'm condoning the rest, or ignoring it. And I'm not, it's just, there's only so much time. But these videos, well, they're all 75 to 90 minutes long, and I think I can spend a few seconds explaining that point, so that then when I say this, for the Soviet Navy, though, the occupation of the Baltic states was great because it gave them more coastline, more port facilities, more infrastructure, and more security for their main base on the Baltic. You can understand that I know, acknowledge all the rest, but I'm talking about this from a naval perspective. From Kuznetsov's perspective, he's achieved power in 1939, he is now in charge. And he's been in charge for, mm, broadly speaking, 11 months when the invasion of the Baltic states takes place. It's a boon. Because he has a problem. He has a very big problem. The Baltic fleet's this prestigious fleet. The Baltic Fleet is this fleet which both Imperial Russia and Soviet Union, including Stalin, are obsessed over. The Baltic Fleet is a hiding to nothing. The Baltic Fleet is trapped. It's kind of like the Black Sea Fleet. Trapped. They can be as big and as powerful as you like, but it's basically like saying, I have the largest rubber ducky and on a um, pond. It's still a small fish pond in the garden, but it's uh, got the largest rubber ducky. But it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything, because I can't really do anything with this navy. I can't do things with it operationally in wartime. There is a perpetual problem for the Soviet Union that's the same that Russia has always faced. Their access to the sea, their access to global maritime trade is perpetually under threat. If you're a paranoid person. If you're a person who believes in the value of friendships with your neighbours, etc., then you don't necessarily worry about it. Trade goes through the, stra uh, the Bos Straits of Bosphorus, Straits go through uh, the Straits of Denmark, and everyone's happy. I know Germany and Britain have both done really nasty things to Denmark in the past, so... And quite a lot of the Scandinavian countries, including the Swedes, have as well. But, you know... <coughs> it's, it, it, these things aren't really mentioned between friends. The point is, the Soviet mindset and the Russian mindset isn't so much an abnormal mindset as an old mindset. The modern mindset is, why should you worry about these things? They're all friends, there's international laws. It, it's fine, your ships go through. But if you go back to a mercantilist view, mercantilist economic view, remember? If you control the... You, the the, your wealth comes from territory and resources you control. Those who control the most resources physically are the richest. Well, that can also be applied to strategic scenarios. Those who control the access to the world are the richest. Those whose access is controlled are the poorest, aka the weakest, aka subject to the whims of others. Now, I would say this would have a lot more sway with me 
as something which is seriously believed and a serious part of Russian strategic thinking if they didn't keep buying all their frigating material from the Germans. Who dare ones they keep ending up at war with? World War I. Ah, oh, these brand new cruisers, which are critical to the strength of the Baltic fleet. Thank you very much, Im the Imperial German Navy said. They, they will serve us well. They did. World War II. A lot of the German technological advancement, infrastructure development, and naval growth is paid for thanks to the Soviet Union buying equipment off them. Now you can turn around and you can make the case that the Germans were good makers of submarines. But in the 1930s, they weren't. They really weren't. They were having trouble making their own submarines. Let alone making and supplying gear for others. Look at the options you've got around the world you could go to. You could go to the Dutch. You could go to the British. You could go to the Americans. You could go to the French. You could go to the Italians. All of them are building submarines. And all of them are actually building more submarines and more infrastructure and industry to build those submarines than the Germans. Okay. This is a scenario going on. And this is the S-Class. I decided to get start off with them because talking about them is a good point for beginning on the Soviet submarine journey. Why? Because the Sredenania, medium submarines, were a key part of what the Soviet Navy was apparently looking for. They were actually nicknamed the Stalinets or Follower of Stalins. They were very successful for the Soviets in World War II. They would sink 82,770 gross registered tons of merchant shipping and seven warships. There'd be 56 of them completed. The first few... Wow. Well, the first of the series of them utilised German engines German batteries, and it's only the second, um, the first three series produ uh, production versions, sort of produced the IX series, were all based off German equipment, and then it's the IX bis series, the ones that follow them, S4 and beyond, which are built using Russian equipment. These are critical to the Soviet Navy. They are their new submarines. But, let's note, um, S-2, one of the German uh, engineering ones, was sunk on the 3rd of January 1940 by a Finnish mine off Marke in Swedish territorial waters. Finnish mine, Swedish waters, sinking a Soviet submarine. Yeah, that's the Baltic for you. That is the Baltic as a war scenario. Um, S-1 was scuttled on 23rd of June 1941 at Lebau to prevent it being captured by the Germans. Probably sensible, as it had all equipment on board that the Germans would know how to use, because they'd built it all. And S-3 sunk on 24th of June 1941 at Lebau, in a surface action with Schnell boats, that's E boats, S60 and S35. S4 was rammed and sunk in January 1945 in Danzig Bay by uh, the German torpedo button set T3. S5 was sunk by mine in August 1941 in the Gulf of Finland. Um, S6 was sunk by a mine off Offland, Sweden. A wreck was only found in 2012. S7 was torpedoed and sunk in October 1942 in the Sea of Aland by a Finnish submarine, uh, Vesilishi. Uh, uh, wreck was discovered in July 1998. Um, S8 sunk by a mine off Surasi Island. Wreck found in 1999. Uh, S9 
went missing in August 1943. They found a crew member's body in the 4th of September on Seskar Island, but they don't know what happened to that one. And honestly, it just gets worse for the class as we go on. What is the point I'm trying to make? Well, S1 had been commissioned in September 1939. Uh, S2 also had been actually commissioned in September hmm, 1936, and S3 commissioned July 19. For, uh, 1938. They had not had a long time with these vessels to get used to them. 4, 5 and 6 were, had only been commissioned in October 1939. The Soviet Navy was building itself up and it was building itself up from a position of... How do I put this politely? They were building themselves up from a position of devastation. If we look at the previous class, the S-Class, the Shuka class submarines, which were, theoretically at least, entirely, entirely Soviet. They are started production for, well, science service in 1932. And they build 88 of them. And again, the vessels that serve in the Black Sea and the Baltic and the North Sea, Northern Fleet, they don't really have a good survival record. They really don't. In fact, if you take out the ones... Well, let's put it let's even on. Even with what, including the ones in the Pacific, 35 out of 88 are lost. And the Pacific Force, well, that's probably the largest chunk of them. What am I saying? The Soviet Union fights wars in the late 1930s and the early 1940s. Not just World War II, aka the Great Patriotic War. It fights the Finnish War. It fights a war against Japan in Manchuria. It fights all sorts of interesting conflicts along its various borders with various powers. In the 1930s it also, also fought the Poles. And lost. What does this all mean? Well, if we were talking about a normal service, a service where experience would be built up and institutional memory would be maintained, developed, and people would grow within the service and you would have access to that knowledge to train others and to develop others, you would be looking at probably a very capable fighting force. Their doctrine, their combat capabilities would have evolved, and with all the combat they've been facing, basically fighting non-stop since the Russian Civil War, which meant they've basically been fighting non-stop since the beginning of World War One, which would mean they've been sort of fighting since 1914, you could be dealing with combat veterans who've been fighting pretty much every year for the last, what, Twenty six years in nineteen forty, twenty seven years in nineteen forty one. Which would mean they'd probably have some very fixed ideas based on the scenarios they'd faced, which would be problematic if uh, if they then saw what they looked like in one of those scenarios and turned out to be different. But it would be useful. It would have built you up a force of NCOs, of officers who were reliable, veterans, experienced. However, this is the Soviet Union. This is the organization where you have purges. And not the nice kind we see in movies where people go around and are offing nasty people or sort of things or just being malevolent things. No, these are the purges where it's not 
random citizens going around and you can actually defend against them. No, it's the government. And as I've said before, nothing is more dangerous than the government when it wants to be. They have access to all the information. They have census records. They know where who you are. They know who your friends are, who your family are. They have all that data. Why? Because they know where they, you work and they know whatever, where, who you work with. So the odds are your work colleagues are going to be some of your friends. Uh, they have your marriage certificate. They have your birth certificate. They have the birth certificates of your children. And they have to have all these things for the functions of a state. For taxation, for registry of births and deaths, for knowing the citizens who can vote and how and you know who who can vote when and sort of all those things you need to have that information they have legitimate reasons for that information to be part of a nation state there is part of the thing of cooperating and forming a nation state and working together is you do have to pull that information somewhere but when that information is abused that's when you're in trouble and this is the point about the soviet union and they're turning that on their own armed forces This is why, when you get to World War II, we see services which should be thoroughly used to using their ships, which, even without any level or a decent level of consistent investment going on, should be very capable, very worked up, very understood ships, and yet, what we see are a lot of officers doing the bare minimum to avoid risk. And they have to avoid risk because failure without good reason, loss without very, very good reason of assets will lead to you being branded an enemy of the people and killed. In this scenario, any officer who actually does act with Elan, with some sort of disregard for the book. ...of the Soviet Union. Initially, then, they'll be watched for a different reason, because, you know, nothing's more threatening than a hero. They might rise up against you and lead the rebellion. So, pretty much, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. Hey-ho. The Black Sea, though, is an interesting scenario. The Black Sea Fleet of the Soviet Union, the battleship, the battle cruisers, the destroyers, the various small vessels, the 44 submarines, and many torpedo boats, should have been absolutely romping stomping. If you consider what the Axis forces technically have in that scenario, they have Romania's four destroyers, four torpedo boats, three mine layers, three gunboats, a submarine tender, a training ship, and eight submarines. Germany eventually will, submit, uh, will uh, send, in components, to be sent over there, 16 torpedo boats, six submarines, 49 ASW craft, that's anti-submarine warfare vessels, basically trawlers, and 100 plus landing craft. Italy, Seven torpedo boats and six submarines. Now, Italy could have been a real problem if they'd managed to get their ships through the Bosphorus. Because let's be honest, if the Italian Navy had somehow managed to get to a scenario where they could afford to take their ships out of the Mediterranean, somehow past the Royal Navy in the eastern Mediterranean basis, the Mediterranean fleet, and through the Straits, uh, uh, through the uh, Bosphorus, uh, Straits, Dardanelles, etc. They could have been pretty scary if they'd turned up. I mean, the, 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 they certainly would have had an interesting time from an air warfare perspective, but, you know, that would have been a overwhelming force, but they didn't. They sent seven sort of torpedo boats and six submarines. Bulgaria had 11 torpedo boats, five glorified trawlers, 14 landing craft, and Croatia, 12, again, anti-submarine ships. That is, that should not be a navy which causes them much trouble. They have cruisers and a battleship. 
They have 19 destroyers. They have 84 motor torpedo boats. That's a lot more. Now, admittedly, they have more to defend, but still, that is a lot more. So why? Why does it turn into a very defensive war? Well, because of the fear. But saying that, there is also someone who starts to turn up at this point. There is someone who turns up and becomes pretty well known thanks to the Black Sea. This officer who starts to appear is the officer who takes command of, wow, the Azov Flotilla in October 1941. A Rear Admiral, Sergei Gorskov. Yes, Gorskov starts to appear. And why is it interesting that he appears? Well, in World War II, he is involved from the beginning. He's promoted to Rear Admiral on the 16th of September. Uh, during the Siege of Odessa, he leads a landing party in the area of Gorovia before taking part at command of the flotilla. In late December and early January 1942, he led landings on the north coast of the Kerch Peninsula. During August of 1942, he commanded 150 warships in the flotilla to break out from the Sea of Azov to the Black Sea after the withdrawal of Soviet troops to Novryoska. At this point, the flotilla is then disbanded and he becomes Deputy Commander of Naval Forces and member of the Military Council of Novryoska Defence District. He temporarily commanded troops of the 47th Army defending the region in November during the Battle of Caucasus. Then he is tasked to reform the Azov flotilla in February 1943 and leaves at landings at Tangarong, Maripol and Ospranko before supporting the troops of the North Caucasian Front in the capture of Taman Peninsula. During this time, it seems to be when he starts to make friends with Khrushchev. It's interesting to note that Khrushchev is the one who will eventually appoint him and will get rid of Kuznetsov because Kuznetsov isn't doing what Khrushchev needs him to do. Khrushchev, of course, was very keen on Ukraine. He was heavily involved in Ukrainian politics, and these areas were important to him. And so the officer commanding them was someone he'd taken note of. During the November 1943 Kerch Elgin operations, Gorshkov not only personally supervised the preparation of landing troops for the main attack, he got really involved. And when I say got really involved, he was awarded the Order of Kutsov. Hmm. And the Order of Ushikov, first and second class, for his command during this time. Mainly because you're not supposed to really give him more than that. He's then transferred to the Danube Flotilla. Which is appropriate. And in April 1944, he led it during the uh, Jassy Kishev Offensive and supported the troops of the Third Ukrainian Front in crossing the Dniester and their entry into the Danube Delta. Uh, between September and November, the flotilla went on to support troops of the Second and Third Ukrainian Fronts during the Belgrade and Budapest Offensives. And in December, Gorshkov was promoted. 1944 to Vice Admiral. Sort of been promoted by 25th of September, it's dated as, but it seems to really not come into effect till the December. There's a debate about this. It was transferred to Command the Black Sea Squadron, ending the war in that position. He's mentioned seven times in the orders of Joseph Stalin. In, in his capacity as, in Stalin's capacity, that is, as Supreme Commander of the Soviet Armed Forces. Which is a big thing. 
<sighs> the war in the Baltic. The war in the Baltic is... How do I put this politely? It's a mess. It really is. It's an absolute mess. There are so many different actors playing around, and some of the best people at destroying submarines are the Swedish, who get fed up with everyone trying to attack their convoys when they're supposed to be neutral. So the Swedes do a sort of Switzerland, very enforced neutrality. Also, ducks like this get used heavily for amphibious warfare by the Soviets. They really do develop a real quite a passion for it because it's a good way of moving a large number of troops without actually having to have a large number of ships it does work for them moon sand operation is a good example of the kind of amphibious warfare they get involved in this period and this is something you have to sort of thinking think about when you're talking about the soviet russian navies you have to remember what they're being used for. Again, this affects your view of their ships. But if the ones you're talking about closer to home, they are as likely to be used to support land operations as they are to defend terror their own parts of the ocean. Especially in terms of amphibious operations, because the Soviet doctrine, especially at this point, but theoretically through the Cold War, is a doctrine of manoeuvre. It's a doctrine of deep thrust, deep offensive. Thanks mostly to one of the marshals who, of course, was killed. It's always fun when you realise that you, you've killed most of the good, mar all the good marshals. But hey ho, you know it, it happens when you purge people. Uh, this, of course, uh, took a chest key. Um, took a um, Mikhail took a Vesky, who had sort of really focused in on long range deep operations. The Soviets kept trying for that. What's interesting though is after D D Day, after the Allied invasion of Normandy, Donitz transfers the vast bulk of the surface fleet of the German Navy to the Baltic to try and support the seaward flank of the German army. This meant that there is a constant upping of the pace of war. Now again, the Soviets are supporting their own troops. And you have to think, there's got to be some commanders who are going, right then, I can move my ships freely and go off and hunt German ships, which will be great if I find German ships and sink them. But I will have left the army uncovered. And if the army, if the ch German ships come in and attack the army while I'm away trying to find the Germans, I will get in trouble. And who knows? Maybe even my daughter will be sent off to the, pr to the uh, prison camps when she comes of age. So why would I do that? Gorshkov does all sorts of strange things. He really does. And he has to be incredibly lucky to have got away with it all. Because if any single one of the gambles he'd fail, he, he takes had failed to come off, he would have been in so much trouble. But he took the gambles and he succeeded. So you can say, right, now you can you could use that as an example to turn around and go, well, these officers should have taken the gambles and they'd also been okay. But that leaves aside the fact that Gorshkov basically has the equivalent of throwing natural sixes every single time. Goodness no well no, natural twenties every single time he throws. It's quite disturbing. That's wrong. That's right. I must have talked so long I skipped over it. I don't know how that happened. Anyway. Archangelisk and the war in the Arctic. Okay, so... 
Soviet Union then do something really interesting on Northern Europe because, you know, of course the Germans have capital ships which are threatening the convoys. And, of course, famously, PQ-17 happens. And so the Soviets start thinking, well, if we had our own capital ship in the North Atlantic, in the Arctic waters, it wouldn't happen because we'd go out and we'd be there to protect the convoys and threaten it and, and we'd have the, we get the victory. And they start campaigning for getting capital ships off the British and the Americans because they can't actually afford any of them to build any of themselves. They can't get any of their own battleships out because where are they? In the Baltic and in the Black Sea. Ah, why are they in the Baltic and Black Sea? Because we have no infrastructure to support them elsewhere. So, they get a deal. The deal is this for their share of. Well, a large chunk of their share of the Italian Navy, which they're going to get at the war's end from the victory spoils they haven't yet achieved. As compensation, they sign that over to the British and the Americans, and in return, the British give them an R-class battleship, which the British are going, we are sorry. We know we're sending you what we're sending you to. We s we're sorry. And the battleship's going, but haven't I served you well? Why do this to me? I was a good ship. I worked hard for you. Just, the more and more you look into it, the more and more you feel sorry for that poor ship. She'd just been through a, a repair in an overhaul in the United States, which she'd been through March to September 1943. Um, she then went to the Indian Ocean to take patrol duties, but in 1944, January, she leaves the Indian Ocean bound for Britain. Once she goes to Britain, she's transferred on the 30th of May 1944, to the Soviet Navy. Yes, HMS Royal Sovereign becomes Archangelisk. And leaves escorting convoy JW-59. And so begins the German session with trying to sink her. U-711 um, under Hans Gunther Lang reports hits on Archangelisk and a destroyer. This torpedo, though, had exploded prematurely. Premature explosion. It happens to so many. The Germans, believing they crippled the battleship, then launched several attacks. They basically sent submarines after her. They planned to use Beaver mid submarines. And the Soviets had anti torpedo nets around her and were just going, You keep attacking with torpedoes. We keep getting torpedoes to look at. Thank you. Mm. The Soviet crew commissioned the ship officially on the 29th of August 1944 at Poliani and was the largest fleet in the Soviet uh, ship in the Soviet fleet during the war during World War II. So you'd expect, under this case, she'd be well-maintained and well-looked after. However, they don't have the facilities. She's a flagship of Admiral Gode Levenko, Levenko, who was tasked meeting Allied convoys in the Arctic and escorting them into Koala. She is a Admiral's flagship. And yet, still, they do not have the facilities to look after her. She runs aground in the White Sea in 1947. And then she's returned in February 1949, after Gilead Chesre is transferred to the Soviet Black Sea Fleet. The Soviet Navy had initially sought to avoid sending the ship back, claiming she wasn't sufficiently seaworthy to make the voyage back to Britain. The Royal Navy sent an officer to inspect her though, and so they agreed to return her in January 1949. When she received her safe, the Royal Navy inspected the ship and found much of her equipment to be unserviceable. We cannot draw from that that it was unserviceable in 1945-44. We just know that by 1949 it had ceased to function. And 
the main battery turrets hadn't been rotated while the ship was in Soviet service, well, at least for a few years, because they were jammed on the center line. And so she sold for scrap. The elevation mechanisms uh, from her main battery gun turrets were actually later used on the Mark I radio telescope at Jodrell Bank in Cheshire, built in 1955-57. They had had a hard war in the north. There uh, were, there are now more facilities than there were by a massive margin, but there were really not a lot of facilities to support their fleet. It had been a destroyer and submarine force prior to World War II, and even that was a stretch for it to support. They needed cruisers. They needed a facility to support them. And it needed a lot of facilities to support ships like this. Why did the Soviets not want to hand her back? Well, there are good reasons. They don't want to look that bad, and they knew exactly what situation she was in. And they knew how it would look. It's about perception. But the British were going to require her back because that was the letter of the rule. So you have to wonder how many people in charge of her maintenance were after the report came out and was publicised were um, quietly disappeared off by Comrade Stalin's reach. So, the Soviets get into the post-World War II period. And they keep building certain designs for a while, they keep working on them, they keep developing them, but eventually they start to look at the next generation. And as said, I could at this point start to talk about Foxtrots. I could talk about all sorts of different subs, but I'm going to talk about whiskies. Why am I going to talk about whiskies? Because these are their testbed subs. They seem to use them for everything. If they are trying out an idea, it'll be a whiskey. Whiskies converted for this. Whiskies converted for that. I don't know whether this shows how good the submarines were or how bad they were. Collectively known as Project 613, 640, 644, and 665, there are 236 of them built. 215 for the Soviet Union, 21 for China. Two of them are preserved. They were built from 1950 to 1958 by the Soviet Union. They were built by China from 1956 to 1960. And they are everything for them. All the ideas they have about long-range submarines and how they developed them in the 50s and 60s and all their plans for submarine developments and the large fleet come from the whiskies. This is the point. The Soviet Union are building other designs and other designs are actually some of them are better but this is the one they can build the most easily. Why? Because to a large extent it is based on a Type 21. And the Soviet Union has taken a large amount of German machine equipment, a large amount of German industrial equipment, and an even larger amount of German personnel have disappeared to their various camps and facilities. This is a class they can build and be sure it's going to work, they think. They have a lot of ideas for them. Their first experiments in creating an SSGN, their first experiments in creating everything, come down to this class. They are also a class which scares the bejesus, to an extent, out of the Allies. Why? because they have a surface speed of 18 and a quarter knots and a submerged speed of 13 knots. And that's fast for a submarine in this period. Their surface range is eight and a half thousand nautical miles at 10 knots. Their submerged range was roughly 330 nautical miles at 
three knots. Or 166 Alberts submerged. They could carry torpedoes, mines. Some of them were, well, the Whiskey 1 and 2 were had 25mm and 57mm guns. The Whiskey 3 had her guns remo the guns removed. The Whiskey 4 had 25mm guns again. And the Whiskey 5 had a streamlined conning tower and snorkel. No guns. They were evolving. So here's the point of reference in the 1950s we should sort of look at. This is a British destroyer. It is a very a very gorgeous looking destroyer. It's known as a daring class destroyer. When daring class destroyers had a proper amount of guns on them. Sorry, mildly bias. Yes, another one I wrote a book on. Um, hence it's called ba uh, Tribals, Battles and Darings. I could also be talking about battle class, but I felt like talking about daring for this one. The French have a battleship going around the world, the Jean Bart. And the Americans are introducing the Forestal, the first really new generation carriers, and the Nautilus, the first nuclear submarine. What does this mean for the Soviet Union? Well, there is a problem. When you set yourself up internationally as a socialist paradise, and that's what you're trying to portray yourself as, as a marvel of modern thinking, as the next step on the path of human, social, cultural, political evolution, of the shining beacon that the rest of the world should aspire to, doesn't matter about the reality, that's what you're trying to portray yourself as, and you're going around the world in no aircraft carrier, no battleship. Well, you've got your World War One Ganguts and you've got your Gilio Cesare off the Italians, but no, no, not one of your own. That's a modern ship. Your destroyers and cruisers are not really looking like you want them to be. You're building the, you're building the Svoldovs. They are very good, but I've done an entire video about those, so they're not appearing in here. And the Americans have beaten you to a nuclear submarine. It's just not good for the old image, is it? It's not what the image needs. The image needs to be at the front. The image needs power. This is something you have to appreciate when you're looking at the Soviet Union and you're looking at the Navy. There are three competing things going on which are competing pressures which span their entire Navy. One, a conservative operational approach where you can prove you will be successful. And if you don't, well, you can give a good reason for why you did what you did. So you don't want to step too far out of line. You want to uh, you want to keep within the the rule book for your own safety. The people who do, either if they're incredibly lucky, could end up at the top. But the people who most of the people who do fail, and that failure is rewarded with death. You can hope it's by the hands of the enemy, because at least then you die in glorious battle, and you become a hero posthumously, and it's less likely that your family will get carted off to. Um, a nice camp in Siberia. I, I hear it's very nice this time of year. The second thing, the second thing, is an iterative pro to, uh, an inter iterative approach to construction and development of ships. The generations tend to bleed into each other. There tends to be a lot of development going on, which is iterative. And this affects everything, not just the big hull design of ships, but all the technology. Most of the radars, most of the systems are iterative approaches. There is a great discussion about some of the weapon systems that they use land-based missiles to develop into the naval-based missiles. And why do they follow that policy? Well, it starts off in the 19. That missile is already proven. If it goes wrong, therefore, you have not taken everything out and staked your entire reputation on it. 
because you're adapting someone else's work. So there's someone you can share the blame with. Ah, yes, but you see, our testing has covered this flaw, so it's not our fault. No, 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 this is a fault with the original design team. Let that committee take the pressure. And that committee will go, well, you see, we weren't designing it for that scenario, so that's why we made that decision. So, Comrade Stalin, it's not our fault, because they're using it in a way we weren't designing it for, and as such, that's a problem. And it's in the adaptation, but it works. The base design works, and so the adaptation works. So, neither committee needs to be carted off to the, um... Prisons? Please? Or neither of us needs to be taken out the back. We, we, we really don't want to have a close inspection of the wall and a last cigarette. Do we get a last cigarette? We don't get a last cigarette. This, oh, it's a socialist paradise. Anyway. The point is, there are some leaps being taken here. The daring class. Again, the British take leaps in terms of the electric power and the power systems of these classes. They build one class of ships which have two different types of power set up so they can test it out. In fact, you end up with a scenario where you have eight ships which have four different power arrangements going on to test it out and develop it. So, to an extent, it's the same as the Soviet in terms of that being sort of a testing issue. But instead of them doing one design all built one way and then making a couple of changes and moving on next design, they have done one class and they have tested the four different models in two ships so they can work out whether the ship is the problem or what's the idea and then they're going to pick from that and move on. The Americans have rushed ahead of a nuclear submarine and they will do all sorts of weird testing with it. Fun things like going under the North Pole. I can't think why they would test it going under the North Pole. There is no one who has a massive, massive coastline which runs along the Arctic, uh, the, the North Pole and the Arctic Seas. Is there? And the Soviets don't have a carrier. Stalin wanted one. Stalin wanted battleships. Stalin wanted all this stuff. Stalin wanted it all. He wanted the status of the Soviet Union. And perhaps this is a point at which I'm going to have to be very careful because I'm going to say something which I don't want taken out of context. Because Stalin is really not a nice person and I really don't like what he does and frankly really wish he hadn't been there but I will say this there is an argument that he understands more than all his successors about the position of the Soviet Union all those little men and I mean this little men who come after him people who have been in his shadow for years and using his shadow to cover their own ambition their own greed their own trends for power and violence the soviet union needed to go big or go home it could either be at the front or it could fall from the back but it didn't have it couldn't afford to be in the middle it couldn't afford to be in the mix they needed the status it's not enough to turn up you have to look like you turn up and you're winning you have to look like you are winning this is especially true in a war which is not a war fought necessarily with guns but with political alliances with proxies you have to turn up and you have to look like a winner. You have to turn up and you have to look powerful. Now the Sverdovs are good at that. The Kronstads would have been better. The Sovetsky Soyuz would have been very good in the 1950s. In the 1950s, please note what I'm saying. There was a discussion I had recently with someone which was basically a case of, yeah, in a fight, 
you know, the American, uh, what would the American cruiser submarine, uh, missile, sub uh, missile ships have done, missile cruisers and destroyers and fri what they, they called frigates at the time would do, oh, they'd just launch a missile. And those big anti-aircraft missiles, them coming down ballistic would have been absolutely a nightmare. And they might have been carrying a nuclear warhead. Yes, they'd been very capable and they would have won the battles. But the thing is, war fighting capability only wins the battles in peacetime, the presence ones, if people know it. And the trouble is, in the 1950s, and you can say this in the 1960s, people don't know the power of the missile. These days, we count VLS tubes and everyone knows the power of the Tomahawk. They know the power of the cruise missile. There have been the videos on television. There have been the images. They've seen the bot of the pop marks of the destruction they cause. We know the capabilities. But in the 1950s and 60s, what do they know? The power of the big gun. They know that's powerful. They know that is strong. And if you want presence, if you want to look like you're winning, you need to turn up with something which is a bit of a known entity. Now, myself, what would I have done if I had been the Soviets? Mm, probably built an adapted Kronstadt with two Shadrock launching systems on the back or a, a Silex system on the back. I'm not sure. Maybe maybe a Shadrock system on the back and a Silex system on the uh, at the front to fire either side of the uh, waist of the bridge. <sighs> Replace the secondaries, well, the central secondaries with surface-to-air missile launchers turn it into a hybrid but make it scary as anything and then sail it around the world going look how powerful I am I don't need a carrier to turn up most people don't see a carrier if they do that's a special occasion but having a battle cruiser sailing around with missiles and massive guns <whistles> that would have made the point but the point is, the people who come after Stalin, especially the ones prior to the rise of Khrushchev, they know the cost of everything and the value of nothing. They are very internally focused. The Soviet Union was never going to be for a long term. Totalitarian regimes aren't. They have three massive points of weakness. One... When the leader changes, everything changes out of fear. Two, they have to be inherently conservative to survive in this organization, which means people don't take risks. It can look very strong, but ultimately you can end up with a foundation of lies where people are lying, rather, will not tell you the truth for fear of what will happen to them, so you are basing everything on a lie. And the trouble is, if the choice is you're going to be killed if you tell the truth, or you might be killed if you're found out to be lying, which is your choice? What is there really as a choice to do? This is the problem of a totalitarian regime. Soviet Union also, of course, had this lovely cult of personality. I thought I'd pick, put the picture in there because it does look like some sort of I don't know. It looks like, to me, and please note this, like a male voice choir decided to go for a trendy 1980s white suit look at some point. That's just what it gives me automotives, but that's part of the cult of personality of Stalin. And this is, of course, the picture of him when he died, his, his, his coffin being carried. Loss of Stalin was a big thing for the Soviet Union. And that comes to the next problem. As I said, you have the changeover of successors, you have the fact that people don't 
give you accurate information. And then the third problem, the totalitarian regime. The big, really big problem. Not only can you ever trust the information people are giving you, you always have to live in fear of your own people. And that causes a problem. Because it means when you do have legitimate concerns and complaints coming from the public about your actions, you don't take any notice of them. Or you react in a very heavy-handed manner, which will create problems for you down the road. It might not create problems for you today, it might not create problems for you tomorrow, but it's going to leave a legacy. No matter how you, you change up your control, the media, or anything like that, you are going to have a problem. And transitions are especially problematic. Okay, for this, there are lots of things which can happen. The first thing that comes after Stalin is no one wants anyone to achieve the same level of power he does. Which causes a churn of leadership for the next few years. It also causes the last few people to die trying to achieve power in Soviet Union. And after that it becomes... Whilst people lower down the ranks might die, people higher up, once you reach a certain level, you tend to be retired. Kuznetsov will experience this. The rise of Sergei Gorshkov. It's a few years after Stalin's death. Gorshkov rises. There are many others who are considered as a good chance for leadership. I discussed this in the kinder class. They are options. They sincerely are options. But the big thing about the fall of Kuznetsov, his predecessor, is ultimately he has fallen and risen and fallen and risen. He ended up in a fight with the defense minister at the time, Marshal Zukov. He clashed with him during the war years. When Novryosk, the Gilio Shezre, is lost, well, Zukov removes, yeah, removes Kuznetsov from his post. This helps Khrushchev, who is trying to put his own man in the post. He's trying to get his own people, people he can rely on, into the various posts. And the one he wants up there is Gorshkov. As a result of Zukov mainly being manipulated and being used to attack his old enemy, um... Kuznetsov is demoted to the rank of Vice Admiral and retired and expressly forbidden for any and all work with the Navy. Instead, what he does is he goes off and publishes essays and articles and writes several books. Mm. Including writing his own memoirs. and several books which he ordered to be published posthumously after he died, including a bo uh, several books where he's very critical of the party's interference in the internal affairs of the military, and assists things like the state must be ruled by law. So cute. It's very cute when you consider that, okay, he'd use that system to get the power himself, he'd use that system for his power, for his status. But, as said, he's replaced by Gorshkov. He is replaced by the gentleman who will be in power for nearly 
30 years. A few days short of 30 years. He will guide the Soviet Navy for 30 years. There have been a few discussions already from the videos he's appeared about his medal collection. He earned them. He did. He's one of the few who probably did. But also, there is the fact that, to our eyes, it always looks kind of weird if you're from the West, because we're used to seeing ribbons and bars being added. Instead of award being ordered repeatedly and getting the same medal several times, you get a bar or something attached to your, on your ribbon to, to, to make it look sort of... It's very modest and neat. Whereas this is a very public display of, look at all this person. They're basically wearing a chain mail of medals. I can just imagine his steward, or himself, if dressing himself, I, I would hope he had some help, having to have a map and diagram to make sure they're all laid out correctly. <laughs> And you have to start from the bottom one and work your way up so that they slot properly over each other because otherwise you're fiddling beneath them and that's just that would just look bad. Or maybe you just put them on a, what, your dress jacket and leave them on the dress jacket and don't ever take them off the dress jacket. That's probably what I do, but I'm lazy and not in the Soviet Union. Uh, they might do it differently. But the point about Gorshkov, how's he different from Kuznetsov? Kuznetsov had been turned by World War II into very much a submarine, small combatant gentleman. Uh, you can look at that from the fact that destroyers are still in the production and destroyers being produced. They are really interesting. Someday I'm going to do a video series on the post-World War II Soviet destroyers. It's just... It's something to do at certain points. I, 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 I have... A few videos I want to get into, and those are some interesting ships and interesting design choices. But the point about it is that they've been producing these ships and building all these ships, and curiously haven't found the resources to f kept having issues finding resources to finish off the capital ships. And then, of course, Stalin dies, and those projects die as well. One advantage of a system built on lies. There are usually plenty of lies to go around to uncover to find reasons for why a project hasn't been completed for your boss when they really wanted it done. Lots of other people's lies that you can point to and go, oh, It wasn't me! Look! They've been lying about that and that and that! It's very, very helpful. Gorshkov, though, is about the presence mission. He is about the diplomatic mission. He is about the global reach. In many ways, he is an heir to Stalin in that perspective. And you will see this as the ships gradually go bigger. His pride, what he achieves, the Kuznetsov-class aircraft carrier... <laughs> he does have a habit of naming ships after people he's toppled. It's it's almost as if it's sort of a nice a thing for him. It's, just sort of, it's, just so, it's either his sop or his way of gloating. Yeah, I've kicked you out of post, so now I'm going to name a ship after you. It's a way, of, you know, it's it's a way of consigning them to garden leave. Yes, there's a ship named after you. No, you can never come back. Mm-hmm. It's a possibility. But what he does is he slowly builds up his cruiser arm. He has a line of cruisers. And we're going to be discussing a few of them in this video, but I've already done some videos on the Kenders, the Crestas. I've got the Slavas coming up. They are all interesting vessels, and, and the Kara class, of course, as well.
they're all interesting vessels and they build up on each other. But they're not what he really wants. What he really wants... What he really wants is something to take on the Svoldov role that they've had to fill, but actually to take on the role as would have been, do the role as it would have been filled by the Kronstein class. And that's what the Kirovs are. Because the Kirovs, people turn around and go, oh, they're building a mighty military capability. They're not! They're building something which is a showpiece, which goes around the world, and everyone else's ships turn up and go, ah! You t to turn up with something big enough, you have to take a full aircraft carrier. Which shows they've won, because, oh yeah, to deal with their cruiser, you have to send an entire carrier battle group. Hmm. Who looks weak now? Who looks strong now? That thing is so big. That's the whole point of it. It's how do you win? You win by showing in a presence mission, in a in a diplomatic war, in a Cold War scenario. How do you win? You shop and you look big and scary and powerful. If you want a good example, look at... Well, there is a current navy which is growing, which is does do a lot of work according to Gorshkov's theories. And look at some of the ships they're building. Look at how big, capable and powerful they are. And they look good. It doesn't matter as much if they are good. It does well if you end up fighting a war, of course. But what matters for the presence, the Terence mission, and I've said this when discussing the Royal Navy in the 19th century, is the ships have to look good. It's a good, th it's a really important thing if they both look good and are good. That's great. That's you won the you've got the trifecta. Look good, are good, will fight good. But for a presence the Terence mission, the looking good matters. It matters a lot. But there is a problem. And it's it's quite simple, as Khrushchev puts it. Stalin called everyone who didn't agree with him an enemy of the people. He said they wanted to restore the old order, and for this purpose, the enemies of the people had linked up with the forces of reaction internationally. As a result, several hundred thousand honest people perished. Please note, it was a lot, lot more than that. But Khrushchev is saying this. He's had his own part in that to play, and he is surrounded by people who were involved in that. They need to, or he needs to say these things to allow them to try and assert himself, and get the things post to sort of post Stalin. But he has to say it in such a way that it gives everyone else in the room plausible deniability, because otherwise they turn on him faster than. However, this desire to move on from a Stalin led to getting rid of a lot of Stalin's projects, even ones which made sense. As said, the Kronstadts and the Sovetskis both could have been adapted to the Missile Age quite easily. And very sensibly. In such a way which would have caused absolute heartbreak for NATO. Because in the Battle of the Third World, as Norman Palmer puts it, in the Battle of Perspective, of Image, what could you do? Well, for starters, the Iowas would probably have had to be adapted earlier. The British would have had to probably do something with Vanguard. I'm just, please, that can be your the question for this video. What would the British have done with Vanguard? Exactly how would that have been adapted if you've got a Kronstadt or a Sovetsky Suez going around the world with Shadok missiles on its aft and Silex missiles on its front and surface-to-air missiles as part of its defences? You can... Figure it out if you want what you think the British would do. Myself is... Cr I think they'd be crying. But the thing is... You have Khrushchev 
talking about Stalin and putting him back, you have the replacement of Kuznetsov with Gorshkov, and you have a push again for technology. They have to try and get back. Khrushchev, of course, is a big fan of the space race. He really wants to win that because that is the way to win the status around the world without having to fight a massive war. That's what he's after. He wants to, he wants to win the Cold War without fighting an actual war, which is about image and presence. And they build this. The November class. Nuclear submarines. The Lenensky Cosmol. K3. Makes you wonder what happened to K2 and K1. But we'll leave that to one side. K3, November class. The first Soviet nuclear submarine. Curiously enough, the amount of times I've tried to search and find for actual information of how many of the original crew are still alive very difficult. They were a hand-picked crew. They really were. They were critical for their development. They were the first crew to serve on a nuclear submarine for the Soviet Navy. Only details I have found is that the second in command of the ship, uh, Second in command of uh, the Lenitsky Komosol. He actually uh, in he became captain and served on the ship for several years and was given command of her. In 1962, he twice took his submarine to the North Pole, and he was awarded the Hero of the Soviet Union for this exploit. He actually ended up being a rear admiral and retiring in 1977, serving on the Navy Acceptance Commission for new ships until 1996 when he died. So he died at age 68. The reason I was trying to track these ships down was because one of the things that you often look at with early nuclear submarines is quite literally how good is the radiation proofing going on them. And it seems to be on the earlier Soviet submarines, the radiation proofing isn't necessarily as bad as it is on some of the other earlier vessels going around. However, it then gets worse. It, it, it's kind of one of those scenarios. The first few seem to be very well made. Then after they've got used to doing it, then issues start to creep in. And that's when the Soviet subs start to get their reputation for... Mm, higher than what you'd like in a submarine radiation levels. I hired and background around the boat. But still, the first couple seem to be quite well made, or maybe over-engineered to make sure they work. I do sometimes wonder if that's the secret to it. It's the over-engineering. When the Soviet Union over-engineer something, it tends to be complicated and break down for other reasons, but it tends to be quite thickly built. When they don't, that's when you have problems. Now, there is, of course, the quantity going on. I've talked about the quality. I've talked about the nuclear submarines and the cruisers and the objects they're sort of building with. Well, there are a lot of Ds turning up. And smaller vessels. This is a destroyer. It's got a missile launcher for SAMs. Afterwards, aft, it's got um, guns forward. It's got a helicopter landing pad. It's not a bad design. And the fact is, the Soviets are building a lot of them. But, there is something kind of interesting going on with these ships. As I've said before, I would love to do, and will love at some point, probably get around to doing a series on the destroyers the Soviet Union produces post-World War II. Up until you get to the, well, 
sovereignties really, but other lawyers to an extent. And how these ships are very, very much copy, paste, extend, copy, paste, extend. They're not bad ships. But they really are quantity over quality. Why were SSGN so attractive at this point for the Soviets? And I do realise this is going to be over time. And this is going to be longer than 90 minutes. Hope you enjoyed them. Well, pretty much it's a nice way of tormenting your opponents. Again, it's about actual war fighting, and it's a sensible war fighting. It's taking guerrilla warfare to sea in this period. These ships, there was someone who was writing an article about how these would be used to engage enemy ships and all this sort of thing, and I was thinking, going, no. Especially not these ones. The early whiskey twin cylinders, they're not about engaging ships. You have to A, fire from the surface, and B, know where your target is. That's going to be very difficult to deal with on a, against a surface ship. Especially at a range you want to be on the surface to deal with. However, again, as mentioned when discussing the Kinder class, there is a capability there for attacking harbours. And yes, there's only two missiles. But how many harbours do you have to protect? You have to protect all of them. Because one vessel with two missiles could turn up. It's about making you use resources that you would prefer to use elsewhere. Again, those two missiles are... Well, you could load them with nukes and that would probably would win, destroy the entire port. And in the 1950s, they are certainly more free with the idea of using nuclear weapons than they do get later. But again, jumping straight to the nukes, it escalates things, and the Soviets are not stupid. Talking about nuclear warfare was a good methodology for them in managing the risk, in keeping the risk down to an extent, because you knew what they might do. You understood it. They were threatening nuclear weapons, which were what you used in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And those images, those, the, the, mess, the, the experience, the knowledge, the understanding of what damage those weapons had done was going around the world. And this was a time, of course, when there had been mass bombings of cities in the UK with the Blitz, with stuff done by the Royal Air Force to and the US and United States Army Air, Army Air Corps to Dresden to other cities in Germany and Europe. All that had been done, and Soviet bombers as well. Please don't forget the Soviet bombers. They'd also have their bombing joy. There were lots of cities and lots of people who had lived through cities which had been devastated by bombing. The idea of a nuclear weapon being used was therefore a very big visible threat in their minds. So you talk it up a lot. But actually doing it, knowing you'll get it straight back in return, is a different matter. Because even before you start discussing the fact you'll get it back in straight in return, it's fairly obvious that's where the route would go. You'd use you, yours, they'd use theirs. So what's the conventional option? Well, a conventional option can still be quite dangerous. That's a big explosive, and if that hits somewhere in the port which you don't want it to, if that hits an LNG store or something else like that Whew. you don't need a nuclear bomb to devastate an entire port an LNG carrier goes up there won't be anything left those things are basically pressurized containers they are the equivalent of poking a hole with I don't know something very explosive and shaped probably a nice bit of C4, into a high-pressure steam boiler. It ain't going to end well for anyone who's within any distance of that thing. 
The thing is, Khrushchev, of course, was also, like Kuznetsov, a fan of the smaller ships. I know he talks later on about how he wished they could have afforded to build larger cruisers or carriers or this or that, and he has all these dreams he talks about. But honestly, if they'd really wanted to build them, if anyone could have kept them going after Stalin's fall, it could have been Khrushchev. But he didn't, because he didn't want them. Because he didn't think like that. If Khrushchev was anything, it was a land warfare understanding and a very simplistic standard, but not necessarily ineffective, approach to land warfare. He'd been a part of many, many defense committees, etc. during World War II. He'd been involved in those sort of organizations. He had those ideas. Not always as the movies will make him out to be, but certainly he was involved in the political side of land warfare and had an idea of that from that. And this is where he really overplays his hand, because if he had finished off those, some of those ships, then the Cuban Missile Crisis could have been very different. Because ultimately, they didn't have the warships to force it through. Now, you could say that if they had more warships, then the war would have taken place. That is possible. It is not unlikely. But it's also quite possible that the US would have had to blink. Which could lead to a whole different scenario. Because the, the US want nuclear war. And the thing is, it is brinkmanship. But the fact is, the US can turn up with carriers. The US can turn up with cruisers. The US can turn up with capital ships. I.e. Iowa's if they really want to. They can turn up with a full range, the full arsenal of Navy, if they want to. Soviet Union can't. They have Svoldovs, and the Svoldovs there try their best, but in the end, they are a light cruiser. A large light cruiser, but they are a light cruiser. And that is a limitation on them. They are great for presence. They are not great for status presence. Status presence requires something of status. And a light cruiser, big as it might be, is still only a light cruiser. The Cuban Missile Crisis, of course, ends with the Soviets backing down and withdrawing their stuff from Cuba. And completely unrelatedly and very quietly, America and NATO are drawing stuff from Turkey. It ends, though, also with Khrushchev at his weakest. And this really does cause trouble for Khrushchev. Khrushchev is reduced in power greatly. And that brings us to the new surface ships which start appearing. This, of course, is a Cresta II. In the full Soviet, starting off on the Soviet style. And they start appearing because the case is we need something which has status. The Sveldovs are powerful, but they don't have the power. And we can't start building really massive ships yet because that would be admitting that Stalin was right and we were wrong to cancel them and make us look stupid. So we have to build the biggest cruiser we can build that looks in line with the ships we've already been building. Which is why they go to a yard which has traditionally built destroyers, submarines and smaller ships. Mm-hmm. The same yard which, of course, built the Cresters and the Kinders. The Cresta 1s and the Kinders. This, of course, is the Cresta 2. They're good ships. They're capable ships. And they have interesting capabilities in terms of their missiles and their radars. Everything is an iterative system. Again, how do I, put this out? How do I point this out? Well... And this is using the NATO reporting names. But if we consider that on Varag and Animal Falcon, the Kinder class, they'd had Headnet C radar. 
head net is useful for supporting Surface to MSRs. Kind of work out which one it is. Head net system is used to develop into big net and then big net well is used to develop onwards it does developed into two different systems um, it's developed into well of course head net returns in the cresters as a 3d search system mm. It's always nice to have it around, and it's a new invert. It's a newer version of it, but also headlight, which is a fire control system. Now, when I say developed into, am I saying they're the same systems or the same? No. But what it is is they work through the electronic processes. They know this radar system works for this, and then they work through and they go right. Then so what can we apply? A lot of the radars share a lot of similar technologies because of what they are trying to do to develop them. And the versions fit it. So all these ships, they start off with... The Soviets start off with a technology which works. Usually one they use for land base, and then they have to migrate it to work on the sea base. That's your first problem, because salt water is evil for electronics. Salt water is the nemesis of electronics. I'm always surprised, you know, whenever they have the flash or anything, all these things on, on T, uh, instead of Marvel and DC, they have anyone like that. The fact that they still manage to work around salt water always amazes me, because usually anyone who, anything which is energy based, or use it, or manage the function in a high energy scenario. Salt water is your absolute nadir. Salt water will destroy you. Salt water has always been damaged for ships' hulls and able to try to take them out. Well, it will work on the electronics as well. There's actually another reason why you build the electronics as high up the ship as you can <laughs> to try and keep it as far away from the salt water as you physically can. You proof it against the salt water, but you build it up as high as you can. It's not just cruisers which start to evolve and start to have weapons though appearing out of everywhere. You also have it with destroyers. We have it with almost every ship. It becomes sort of a Soviet style that every one of their ships going to sea will be festooned with weaponry for a reason. They are trying to both build a military capable and a presence capable fleet. They're trying out technologies which they don't always believe will work and they want technologies which will definitely impress someone. If you want an example of this, next time you're on a modern warship or next time you're looking at someone taking a photo of themselves on a modern warship, especially when they're politicians or anyone in the press, they will go and take their photo next to the big gun at the front. Or if the big gun is at the aft, they will go and take their photo at the big gun at the aft. Wherever the big gun is, they will go and take their photo with. Because that's what screams naval power to them. Someone who studies modern naval affairs, etc., will tell them it's the VLS tubes, it's the mushroom farm. You can see from the bridge. But that doesn't impress people. Even with the knowledge of what cruise missiles etc. do, that doesn't impress people. Boxes do not look visually impressive. The way the Soviet U Navy does them, does try and make them look impressive. Come on, if you go back to uh, this one. Look at that. That looks... Ooh. Yeah, look at me, I'm coming. I, I, I look like I'm some sort of big barman or, you know, publican carrying beer barrels, many beer barrels under my arms. Look how big and strong I am. It, you know, it looks impressive and scary. Still, I can guarantee they go take their photo next to the double 57mm, 57mm sitting on the waist aft after the torpedoes. Because... That's the big gun. 
they might, might take their photo at the bow with the anti-submarine warfare rockets behind them, the SAM and those big, uh, those missiles, they might do that, but they're probably going to take a photo next to the big gun. And this is the problem for the Soviet Navy when they're building these ships, because what do you do? Do you build your fleet to fight a war, or do you build a fleet to fight peace? Do you build your fleet to be military capable, or do you build your fleet to be diplomatically capable? And the reality is you need to build both. You, need, you can't afford to pick one or the other. It's often turned us into a choice of between one and the other by treasuries and various financial institutions, because if you're building something which has war fighting capability, but you want to build it to be capable of doing the presence mission, it's going to cost money. If you build something to want to build something that's capable of doing the presence mission, but also has war fighting capability, it's also going to cost more money. It always costs more money to do both, rather than look at one or the other. I would say if you're building for presence and presence, so it, presence starts to be your big thing, and that's where the things like fitted in the fall, not with, start to creep in. Uh, again, other discussions I've had recently with people are, oh, why are these navies still building ships which they call destroyers? I wouldn't call those destroyers. They could be, they should have just called them frigates or something like that. It's a status thing. It's a presence thing. And yes, to you, who's thinking in terms of actual military war fighting capability, it cannot seem like a big thing. But to the diplomats who get the invitation to dinner aboard the frigate or aboard the destroyer. Honestly, you could save money by just calling them all cruisers, which is pretty much what the Soviet Union do with all their large ships. And why do they do that? Because there is value in a name. And because the Soviet Union goes from building a war fleet and building for a war fleet in the 1930s. Rebuilding a fleet and then building a war fleet. To building a battle fleet for want of a better phrase, in the late 1940s, early, very early 1950s, to building a coastal fleet, exercise fleet, in the early 1960s, uh, mid to late 1950s, to building a global presence fleet in the 1960s. There are transitions throughout this period. Anyway, I am now going to be way over 90 minutes, so I'm going to both apologize. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed. I'm going to flash up the videos we've got coming up on the channel, and hopefully you'll see something you like coming up, and I hope you join me for more of them. Thank you very much for watching, and take care. Wow, well, that's slightly out of date, but that's in date, and yes... We have the Patreon. The Patreon 68 videos um, are, of course, 4.7 inch instead of 4.5 inch gets developed, which is an interesting idea. And on Monday, I have the HMS Sack CS Sackville, which is going to depend on a lot of my video editing skills. So cross fingers and pray for me. Well, probably not to go. You don't have to go that far, but definitely cross fingers for me. Thank you very much. Take care. And bye. And remember, the question is. What would you do if you were the uh, French? I'll add in the Jean Bart and the um, Royal, Na Royal Navy of Vanguard if the Soviet Union starts producing Kronstadt or Sovetsky Suez with um, half missile, half gun armaments. <laughs> Thank you very much. Take care.